God. Praise God. Amen. Spirit of the Most High God, in the name of Jesus, today, impart your word unto our spirits, Lord Father. Impart your word unto our spirits. Let our minds, let our candles be lit by you only. Our spirits are like a candle, and you're that fire, you're that light, Lord Father. Ignite yourself in us, that we may be fruitful and show forth your graces. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Anybody here for the first time? Usually we have, a, we have somebody. Anybody see me for the first time? No. I'll still introduce myself. My name is Pastor Bob. <laughs> Praise the living God. I'll pick from where we stopped or what we shared last week for the benefit of one or two people. Very short. Last week we spoke about wisdom. And we identified three kinds of wisdom, but there are very many. There's elevated wisdom and there is uh, earthly wisdom. There is uh, wisdom that is demonic. There is wisdom that is sensual. There is wisdom that is human. But uh, we focused on three. And we said there is a... Uh, I'll use Greek language. I'll give you the meaning. We said there was uh, Sophia. It's a kind of wisdom that has everything to do with anything that is low, anything that is high, anything that is spiritually low, anything spiritually high. And we're saying that is a kind of wisdom imparted unto us. But once you have Sophia, it, is t it goes beyond low and high naturally and low and high spiritually. It goes to a realm that another dimension that is not, it is only God's to give or it is only yours to take. That is why we say we can know anything right now. All together. I can look at something, I can choose to be in any environment right now because of that kind of wisdom. It takes care of natural things and super natural things, both high and low. But it's not limited to that definition. It goes beyond that esoteric knowledge, knowledge that is hidden somewhere. It's a secret of God. But God says, to you I have presented my secrets. And with that kind of wisdom, you don't need to be a prophet. How together? Traditionally, we know that prophets have access to secrets. But with that kind of wisdom, you don't have to be a prophet. We gave two examples of Ahitophel in the Bible. The one who worked with David, with David and then conspired with his son Absalom to go against David. And the Bible says that anyone who inquired of him was as though he had inquired of God. Now together, he was a man that spoke as the oracles of God. Praise God. That is one example of a man that had that kind of wisdom. Another person we have is Daniel. He was not a prophet, but today most of us know him as a prophet. He was not a prophet, but he was a politician. He was given to studying the word and prayer, that he opened up realms that brought us revelation before it was ever even mentioned. So today, I encourage somebody, I encourage somebody, that uh, you do not have to be apostle, prophet, pastor, evangelist, teacher, priest, I don't know which other title you like, bishop, doctor, we have those titles, deacon. You don't have to do those things or try to be anything else. Just be you, be given to the word of God, be given to prayer. Nothing shall escape you altogether. But we have an advantage that we have prophetic grace as well. Now, all that is encrypted within wisdom, Sophia. Praise the living God. Then we talked about Sunesis. Sunesis, I gave, I gave definitions which I believed you would understand. Sunesis is simply understanding of earthly and spiritual things, both low and high, but going beyond what the common man sees, going beyond what even the spiritual man sees. I gave an example that today 
many of you like going to the beach, right? But we said, we asked last week that, do you know where glass comes from? Many people did not know. And I told you glass comes from sand. But every time you're walking on the beach, you're walking, you're walking on millions of dollars, and you're saying, Father God, I need a breakthrough. All you need is wisdom, understanding of so, sunesis of Sophia, understanding of, of a certain kind of wisdom. Altogether, some of you here, you have skills within you. Nobody taught you, but you're still waiting for capital. Altogether, and yet the thing is with, within you. We gave an example of an American who started, uh, what did he start? He, he, has a, he started a company that makes paper, what do you call it, those funny plates? plates take away plate, plastic, whatever it is. And he's one of the richest men in the world. He's worth not less than $10 million. Praise God. Let's use the guy of KFC. We all like chicken. Okay, maybe. Uh, I'm told, if I, if I get it right, I think he started that company when he's about 70 years old. And uh, he never lived the best life. But he began, today KFC is KFC. You could have a gift inside you called wisdom and uh, you're still waiting for breakthrough and your breakthrough will never come through anything else until until you discover who you are all together until you discover who you are praise the living god that's up today you've, you've we all everybody wears clothes right if we if we buy you a sewing machine if we tell the spirit of god has said we give you a sewing machine you'll think we have undermined you right and yet, you could be the next Tommy Hill figure, the next Louis Vuitton. You guys who like brands, those are the ones I know. I don't know others. All together, you could be the next big thing, but you're saying, ah, this is too small. All together, you want to first own worker's house, then you can say you're rich. No. It starts in the small things. Some of you are skilled. You, for women, by gifting, by nature, you can cook. For you to start cooking, you'll be like, ah, me, I have three degrees. How do they see me cooking? Everybody eats food every day, every day. And you, you as your three degrees, when you go to a hotel, what do you do? You eat food. So, understanding what is within you is the best thing that can happen to you. Not necessarily what is outside you, because what is within you is what is going to attract what is outside you. We called it favor at some point. Favor is not necessarily outside you. It is from within you, and it attracts everything that is right. Praise the living God. Yesterday I had an encounter with somebody, an engineer. And uh, we were driving together, and he said that, I've started ad that he has started admiring cars. Then I laughed, and he asked, why are you laughing? I said, now because you've started admiring them, you're going to have a car. But because you never admired a car, you thought it was bigger than you, it was beyond you. Uh, you never thought, it, it, ne it would never have happened to you. Now I'm waiting for the testimony. As a man thinketh, so is he. Open your mind. Imagine things that seem impossible. It will be so. Another kind of wisdom we spoke about was phronesis. Phronesis was simply a force that becomes you. A force that forms your personality. And I gave you an example of Moses. When he reached the Red Sea, the option he had was to either turn back and fight or wait to be killed. And some of the people he was with said, did you bring us here to perish? There were cloves and onions and this and that, where you picked us from. But the force, when he cried to God, God told, basically tells him, what do I have to do with you? Stretch forth your hand and proceed. And when he did, the Red Sea opened. It was a force that drove him. I'm sure we have all experienced these things, where you have a conviction which is more than usual. A conviction that is more than usual that it is more powerful than have you ever read the Bible and you just start screaming or you just start crying 
Force does not be some, have to be something that is pushing you physically. You speak forth and it is so. Praise the living God. And all those are kinds of wisdom. Praise the living God. So today, one thing I can guarantee is that as long as we are speaking about a subject, it starts to happen in you. How together? Not by might, not by power, but by the Spirit of God. I, Bob, the person, have no power to transfer information into your spirit. But by the Spirit of God that works in me, as I speak, you become. Amen? Praise the living God. So today, we are going to continue from there in a different way. The subject of wisdom is too wide that uh, we, we cannot teach it in one go. And I'm not continuing from where we stopped. I'm just teaching something else. But it's also going to reveal one thing about us. Praise God. Okay, today, our message, I've titled it, Your Resolve and Choice. Your Resolve and Choice. Resolve is really a force or a conviction. A deep conviction that you have decided and nobody can change your mind. But in the process of time, as you have already decided, some people get to struggle with choice. You start, maybe you meet hurdles. A hurdle is to be skipped over. And uh, you start to think, maybe I did not believe rightly. Maybe this is too big for me. And you want to backtrack. Praise God. The Bible says we are not of those that draw back. We are not of those that go behind. Once you go forth, remain, keep your resolve. Believe me, that force of wisdom, it will be. I can tell you a funny story. Though today I never came to tell stories. A family lost a husband. Now this man was a powerful man, I think a judge or something like that. Very powerful, and be sure all his circles, circle of friends are very powerful. Now it turns out that this guy had a secret family. These things happen, we know them, right? He had a secret family. Now, the friends around, the best friends, best men, best whatever, for them they know their family, but the wife doesn't. But now this wife also has a, a, a brother who is like a judge, also a very big man. Of course, on that day, time for mourning, everyone is mourning in their house. The house which is illegal is already full of people. People are crying from this way, but the body, of course, is coming to this side. So people are crying from two places. Now, this lady doesn't know the other lady, but at that time, today, social media is like, do you know, there are two homes where they are mourning, and there is a son on the other side as well. Each home has children. Now it comes to things like inheritance and all that. But all this, that battle is happening at the vigil itself. That is a time to take time off and cry maybe. But already drama has ensued. Now because the wife, the real wife, has powerful people around her, she wanted nothing to do with the other guys and they were not supposed to come for, for the burial, whatever it is. But the children of this lady, the original wife, they are okay, they look like the father. But the other guy was the real photocopy of the father. So the moment he arrives, everybody has to recognize that surely. But now the friends around know this wife. You ladies, your, your, your girlfriends know, your, is it men, is it men? Or, the people around you, they know the people who are not around you. You've understood me. But they have to pretend. To, they're on your side. They're not pretending. But they cannot pretend that they don't know the other one. And they cannot be mean to the other one. So when the siblings of this one get violent, these very people are the ones who stop. Now there's the big judge who decides, throw these people away using all means, army or police, whatever it is. Now, the person who arose is from this church. 
I got the story while I was ministering. Went and threatened the judge. And the judge got scared. I don't know what force she used. I don't know. And she said she does not know where it all came from. But her conviction was real. She threatened the judge and things somehow got organized. After that, she disappeared. They tried to look for like, there's this lady. We don't know where she's from. People imagine maybe she's from, I don't know, state house. I don't know. But ultimately, this, the thing came down and everything, we cannot say it all settled at that time, but peace prevailed. Now, she's born again, right? Where did that force come from? If it were not that she's the peacemaker. How to get but today I'm telling you that there are many things around you that you don't know, but you're happy. And uh, ignorance is bliss, right? But even when something comes before you, remain peaceful. All those powers that be, you as the small Christian, if you have God, you have power to subdue these guys. And this story became, it went up, it climbed the ladders, that the, other, the, the judge's job was threatened because of one young girl who he could not even remember. So from that day, I started telling this, this is a TMS person that even me now, I fear you. But she was giving a testimony that she does not know where this thing came from. Remember, we picked this story from Moses and said he reached the Red Sea and he will not, never know possibly what opened the Red Sea. But there is a force that becomes you. And this force is not outside you. It is inside you. But the question is, do you know it? I'll call it the spirit that operates in you. Do you know that spirit? Do you recognize that spirit? You're able to shut down things. Like the force of Elijah that stopped the rain for three and a half years. Are you aware that that force is inside you? Or have you gotten to know that force? And now you're taking a choice that I, I, I'm not worthy. That is the bigger challenge for we Christians. We, 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 we claim unworthiness. Altogether. God has deemed you worthy. But you want to be un unworthy. Because you're looking at your natural circumstances. You're looking at your so-called failings. And God has said, no. You're the one. Just like Moses, he's a stutterer, right? He doesn't speak eloquently. He's referring God to his brother. And God tells him, am I not the one who made the mouth? Praise the living God. So today in our teaching, your resolve and choice. But we are really also highlighting the spirit that operates in you. Praise the living God. I'm going to read something. We have played around with this scripture for many times but there is always new knowledge to pick from it there is always new knowledge genesis chapter 2 verse 8 and 9 we have shared genesis many times but revelation knowledge i've said is progressive but in this case it is wisdom amen genesis chapter 2 8 and 9 and the Lord God planted the garden eastward of Eden, and there he put the man who he had formed. Everything there God has come from God's hand. So everything God has made is perfect. Verse 9. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. That is it. So God has everything here has to do with God's hand. All together. And remember, the way the devil tempted Eve, he, he talked of sight and pleasant for food, right? And the desires of the heart, right? Now, and God is saying, he's the author of all these things. So it was his good pleasure, his good purpose to, for us to enjoy these things. All together. Praise the living God. So here, we are going to focus on the tree of life and also and the tree of good and knowledge of evil. By the time God made these things, 
it was his good pleasure, his good will for us to enjoy these things. Maybe the timing. Altogether, like when a child is born, they don't start feeding on the food that you like. It's a process. Their body has to adjust. Praise the living God. We'll go to, give me verse 16 and 17. We'll continue. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may eat freely. Of every tree of the garden you may eat freely. Next. But of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest, therefore thou shalt surely die. Praise God. Now remember, the Lord has not talked about the tree of life. Meaning the option to eat of it was present. Altogether, the option to eat of it was present. But at this point, when God says you'll surely die, this is a spiritual death. We all know that, right? It's not a physical death. But if you're spiritually dead, you're, you, you're as good as physically dead. Amen? So God here is telling, is releasing a word that you can eat everything except of the tree of, of the knowledge of good and evil. So the tree of life was actually an option to be eaten. Praise the living God. Genesis 1 Genesis 3, 1 to 5. This we have read many times. There's something we're looking for. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, has God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Indeed God said, right? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the tree, of the fruit of the tree, trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has, God has said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. This is what Eve is saying, but this is not what God necessarily said. But we'll say, maybe there is information that was not given to us. Altogether, verse 4. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. Why did he say that? Because he was surely, he was dead and he was still alive. Spirits. When the devil rebelled against God with his cohorts, they were condemned forever. They don't have the opportunity to repent. You and I, we have that privilege. Now together. But we must reach a point where we don't need to repent. Does that make sense? I know I've joked around here that uh, the crusades, it crusades overnight where you go, they tell you to repent for two hours. It's okay to repent. But if you're repenting every day, what are you repenting? That is my argument. Okay. For God does know that in the day that you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened and ye shall be as God, knowing good and evil. That's it. Praise God. So we are seeing that there is a lot of their games here being played. And uh, the devil already knows. He also has a certain wisdom. And he's saying the things that will be, and I'm telling you, but there's nothing new that he has said. He's only manipulating what God has said. And he's trying to confuse this lady. Praise the living God. Now give me verse 22 and 23. Same chapter. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become one of us, to know good and evil, and now, lest he put forth his hand, and take also the tree of life, and eat and live forever. 22, 23, I believe. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden, to till the ground from, where, from whence he was taken. Give me back 22. So what I'm looking at here is, it was God's good will to plant the garden. He put there two special trees and other, but the two special, these guys were only not supposed to touch the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And when they did, 
the devil had already told them that you will live forever. Already, these people were in eternity, they were alive. But now they received the dead life. And here it is, the Lord is saying, let's, let's remove these people from this garden because they may also touch the tree of life and live forever. So the tree of life is uh, it's an image of Christ, really. It's an image of Christ. But we're saying today that uh, Adam and Eve, today our, our, our subject is resolve and choice, right? They had the choice to partake of the tree of life. But because of a lack of wisdom, they partook of the very one that God had said, no. I know we have been taught, at least I'm conscious of it, we have been taught that uh, God were not supposed to partake of the tree of life. How many have had that teaching? Thank you. It is not in the Bible. I'm using the scriptures. It is not in the Bible. The only reason God did not want them to touch it after is because if they had touched it in the fallen nature, they would be eternally condemned, just like the devil. The devil has no room to repent. But for us, now the knowledge that we have, the knowledge of good and evil, is already our problem. Because our knowledge is limited. All of us are ignorant in one thing or the other. And yet God's purpose, in his wisdom, was for us to have understanding of all things, natural and spiritual, and even beyond. But today, grace has come back to us through Christ Jesus, that we still have access to this very thing. But again, because of the knowledge that we have, we like to play that card of I'm not worthy, I'm not worthy, I'm not worthy. Now together, and today what I'm saying is, can you change your resolve? Can you make the better choice and come out of that place? There is nothing you're ever going to say to God or do that the Lord God does not already know. All together. And there are vessels of dishonor and there are vessels of honor. Imagine you were Jeremiah. Would you bear the pain that he bore? Would have said that God has abandoned you. And yet Jeremiah was in God's perfect will. Imagine Moses, after being raised as a prince, 40 years, next 40 years he goes into the wilderness to be a shepherd. Would you think God is with you? Would think he has abandoned you? You'd really think you're not worthy, right? Imagine Jacob, God told him, I will surely bring you back to this land, right? He went and suffered for, I think, 26 to 28 years. And then God met him and said, remember the God of Bethel. Would you have imagined that Jacob is in the will of God? Today, the life you're living, the pains you've gone through, the perils you've gone through, do you imagine God has abandoned you? And thus you start taking the wrong choices? Because you're like, ah, for me, basing on what I did in S4, in S6, ah, campus was very bad, surely I'm not worth it. Praise the living God. How many of us have those thoughts? Praise God. So many times, your resolve is challenged by your choices. Refuse, refuse to think you're not worthy because of the mistakes you've made. Those mistakes can be corrected. Praise the living God. Praise the living God. Today, that should be able to help somebody already. As we speak, I say, wisdom is being transferred into your spirit to do. The word is excavate. Like Uganda, we always had oil, right? So who, who is that very wise person that discovered it? Altogether. There must be somebody who is wise. But the easiest person to say is Museveni. <laughs> they say he's the cleverest man in Uganda. Today, maybe your village, maybe you have gold under your, 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 your grandfather's heart, but you're busy crying. This, we go to Kampala. When we reach Kampala, we'll have made it. Praise God. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Challenge God. The Bible says, if any man lack wisdom, let him, let him ask, and he will give you freely. 
but interact with wisdom every day. The same way you interact with the Holy Ghost. Speak to wisdom. We, last week we shared that wisdom is referred to as a her. Wisdom is like a mother. She cannot withhold her love from you. Good morning, wisdom. Try and do the foolish thing. Good morning, wisdom. Today, show me something nobody knows. Believe me, you will discover something nobody knows. I told you in the beginning of this prophetic thing that those are the questions I used to say to God. But I felt like I was talking to myself. But today, I surely know that he had me. Now I no longer have the luxury to say, God, okay, show me something I don't know, because that's the life I live. Amen? And I'm saying, change your resolve. Challenge God. And no matter how much God gives you, it is still too small compared to what he can give you. Out together. So, you have little. You have not because you ask not. Or maybe when you ask, you ask amiss. The Bible says. Challenge God. Praise the living God. Praise God. Now, when Jesus came, we're talking about resolve now. When Jesus came, his resolve was sure. He never came to go left or right. He came about kingdom business. He came about the business of God. He came and met people who seemed to know God. People whose resolve for God was strong. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, people who knew the law. And uh, he did not mind them. He came and did his part. And then he exposed the contrary wisdom that was in the earth. You know, you can seem to be very wise, and you need just one wise man to bring you back to zero. Ahithophel was the sharpest prophet. I like to use the word prophet. But he was the wisest man that when he spoke, you inquire of him, the Bible says you are like you have inquired of God. But one man called David said only one thing. He said, Father God, turn his wisdom into foolishness. That is phronesis. A force that becomes who you are. That for one second or two or three or four or five seconds, he became greater than a hip than a hip to fell and destroyed him. Did Ahitophel speak anything contrary after that? No, he gave the perfect advice, but it was rejected. And because of pride, he went and committed suicide. Then you realize that his wisdom was the best at the moment, but again, it became the most foolish. What am I saying? No matter how much God has lifted you and everybody is worshipping you, one word from a man in authority and your wisdom is foolishness. How together? Paul was told in Acts 9, I believe 9, 5, can you kick against the pricks? Can you kick against the pricks? Paul was devout. He was killing Christians in the name of God. He knew he was serving God. His resolve was sure. But God tells him, yes, God tells him, you cannot kick against the pricks. Even though you've attained a certain wisdom, it can come back to zero. Praise the living God. So we are saying, once you've attained, take the right choices to continue increasing. In the sight of God, when you finally make $100 million, you'll think, ah, you've made it now for you, you've made it. Nobody can tell you anything. And yet God is saying, what my desire for you is $100 billion. But because you've reached a hundred million, the cap, you, you, you relax. You relax. How many of us are like that? When, when you've struggled to, you've prayed, you want something, and then it comes forth. Then you're like, then you've arrived. And yet God is saying, this is the beginning, but your wisdom is limited, and you've refused to proceed beyond what you have begun with. Praise God. Are we together? It's a testimony in my life. The first time I, I, I prophesied, I went back, I, I, near, I think I cried. I'm like, God, what is going on? Now me, I thought, then when I understood it, I'm like, okay, it's working. But uh, was, that was just the beginning. Today, I know one million times more than I knew five, ten years ago. 
And I learned that uh, the greatest thing you can have in wisdom is patience. All together. If you don't know how to be patient, you're finished. You'll be like Joseph. Any kind of dream you have, you tell everybody. The very people you're telling are going to kill you. They're going to sell you. Genuinely, you have wisdom. Genuinely, they fear your wisdom. But your wisdom can be turned into foolishness. Praise God. So, unto your wisdom, add patience. Unto your wisdom, add patience. Praise God. I know somebody who wants to get married. They came to me, Papa, Papa, Papa. Hey, you said before this, before we get married, uh, we should come to you or come to a spiritual person or go to a pastor, your spiritual father, whatever, whatever, so that there are no mistakes. So they come and I tell them God's mind. And God's mind was... Uh, mm -mm. Now, this person is very clever. They go back and then they come back. But Papa... We can petition God, right? I said, yes. We can petition God. So they are applying wisdom that you can petition God, which is true. We have short, talked of the perfect will, acceptable will, and, and, uh, and good will of God. So we petition, and we pray, and we cast out, we remove, we uproot, we what? We do all those things, and it is well. And I said, it is well. And I, but I also add that but we will pr continue praying. In other words, you've chosen acceptable, there are challenges ahead, which you will overcome, but it is going to be painful. Altogether. Moses, the perfect will of God was for him to be a prince and redeem the Israelites in Egypt as a prince. But he chose another way. He went and had training afresh, and uh, he came and they suffered through the wilderness, right? Did he make it? No. Did the latter generation make it? Yes. Out together. The perfect will of God is too simple for us to allow. Does that make sense? It is given to you so simply that you're like, no, uh, no, 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 no. This is not it. There has to be, I, I need to be involved. There's something real. It's like you, you wake up today, for the guys, you wake up today and you're looking like Arnold Schwarzenegger. You, you'll be like, ah, but no. Out together, suddenly you start going to the gym, and yet God just gave you muscle. I know people who are strong, and they have never been to any gym. Now you who has been to the gym, when you see him, you're like, but how? Then you inspire him to come to the gym. His is a gift. Yours is hard work. <laughs> Choose the gift. Amen? Praise the living God. Have we understood each other? I know someone who goes to the gym and now threatens people. <laughs> Praise the living God. We have all done those things. First time I went to the gym and you start feeling muscles are growing, you started threatening people like this, that my finger is too strong, it cannot be straight. Like, watch out. <laughs> that is what wisdom does to you. you. You become too wise that you start kicking against the pricks. And here, God is not fighting you. You're fighting yourself. And we're saying, let us know ourselves to a point that we do not destroy ourselves in wisdom. Now that I'm a man of God, I attack you because you're a man of God. I want to prove to you that I'm better than you. Who anointed you? It's God. So if I dare to fight you, I'm fighting myself. Praise God. Praise the living God. Are we together? Everything I'm saying, by the way, is not part of what I'm supposed to teach. <laughs> so let's allow that God is leading me. Praise the living God. Okay, let's read uh, Luke chapter 9, 51 to 56, I believe. Actually, it goes up to 60. And it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up. He steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem and sent messengers before his face and they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him.
to prepare for him. And they did not receive him. The people, the Samaritans did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. All together. How many of you have done that thing? It's called Ntondo in Uganda, I think. Like somebody, I think, is giving you something. Then they're like, no, no, but let me remove some and share with this person. Then like, okay, take all your thing. That, that is really what this is, right? I think I got it right. Okay. And when his disciples, when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, will, wilt thou that we command fire come down from heaven and consume them even as Elijah did? Now, the disciples were offended at the act of these people. And they were like, now, these are candidates for destruction. They're now applying their wisdom, right? That's why I say it is very dangerous to have someone with a little anointing. They have to exercise it and prove that they have it. Now, here immediately they want to kill these people. And it is possible. Did not Elijah say, let fire fall, and it consumed 50 and 1, then 50 and 1, and then the third group said, uh, regard, have regard for our lives. Then he went and met the king. Out together. So, these guys were working with Jesus. Maybe they had this fire. I don't know. But we're going to find out that they didn't actually have it. Have you ever been elevated in your mind when you're around people who... In the Kano language, you say people who are bad, yeah? People of high stature. When you're around them, even you who is of low estate, you start swelling. And you're the one who seems to know most, the one who seems to be the richest. You even walk in slow motion. We're talking about wisdom. All together. Usually people who have money don't, don't show off. People who have power usually don't show off. Okay, maybe in Uganda. Yeah, maybe in Uganda. Uganda is a special case. Yeah. But if you find, let us say, I don't know. Let's use spiritual ground. Have you ever heard Pastor Chris bragging? Let me use Pastor Chris because not the Chris is of here. But even them, I've not seen them bragging. Now, Pastor Chris Oyakilome, he's like, he's a god in my own language. But his humility is even, it's fearful. He's too humble that you fear him altogether. But he's like the greatest of them in our time. That, that is my opinion. My opinion, not yours. There's nothing he has no access to. This is a man who argues with the whole world. <laughs> he presents his case and the whole world is shaken. I think during lockdown, he had the teaching and he had 3 billion viewers. Was it 3 billion? Something like that. Now, isn't 3 billion like half the world? Now you open a church and you have 10,000. I don't know which language we'll have to greet you in. Praise the living God. Let's continue. Okay? But he turned, Jesus turned, and rebuked them and said, you know not what manner of spirit ye are of. That is my interest. If you're reading NIV, I don't think it has that part. Yeah? It doesn't have. So now we're understanding each other. Please get a King James Bible. You may not like the English. I know it is complex, but you'll get used. Now, Jesus turned and rebuked them and said, you, know not, you do not know what spirit you have, but it's not in NIV, it's eliminated. And there, we have, over time we have discovered there are very many scriptures that are eliminated in the NIV. I'm not saying it's a bad Bible, it helps us dilute English, but the English you know, you can understand King James. Especially ladies. Ladies are the ones who like sweet nothings. They deceive you. <laughs> my god they deceive you in shakespeare english let's call it shakespeare and you go happy that ha ah, they told me they told me what did they tell you i don't know but they told me altogether so 
I'm not saying NIV is not a Bible. I'm not going to ban Bibles like Pastor Virginia. But I'm saying, have maybe have variations, variations, especially the apps. Eh? It can give you very many. If you love your NIV, it's okay, but have other variations. Praise God. So Jesus is telling these people that yes, you have a great resolve. You have a great resolve, but you're making the wrong choice. We say today our title is uh, your resolve and choice. Your great resolve to serve, to destroy is high, but is it the right choice? Therein is your wisdom, foolishness or not foolishness. Praise the living God. We continue. I think we'll reach like verse 60, 62, something like that. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. Just hold. You remember the scripture that says, if you go to a city and they, they reject you, dust off your feet and go to the next place. Just do that. Just go to the next place. God always has a, a, a place of assignment for you. Praise God. And it came to pass that as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I follow thee. I will follow you wherever you go. I'm, I'm diluting English. Uh -huh. Next, 58. Verse 58. And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has not where to lay his head. So basically, the Lord has rejected him, more or less. We could say he has rejected him. Or he has, he has he's telling him, no, don't, don't follow me. You're following me, but where I'm going, you cannot manage this journey. But some of us love Jesus so much that we want to follow him and do what he did. And it is not your purpose. It is not part of God's plan for you. And therein you go and you suffer, you suffer in ministry, and your ministry starts, it becomes the one of suffering, like ah, ministry is hard. If you're a minister, you have to suffer like this, like that, like that. No, there are some ministers who don't suffer the way you think they should, or the way you have suffered in ministry. Example of Joseph. Why did he suffer? He was in God's plan, but also it was because he had Rugambo. If Joseph had never told his brothers about his dream, would it have happened? It would have happened. As in God revealed it to him that this is what is going to be. So it still would have happened. But he helped this guy, he gave these guys tools against himself. Amen. Okay, 59. And he said unto another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, Allow me first to go and bury my father. Now, there are those of us who are called of God, but we still have things, to, we have dead things we want to, 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 to handle. The Lord has redeemed you, he has forgiven you, but you still want to go and like, let me first go and handle these things. You cannot handle them. The Lord has said, come the way you are. Praise God. 60. Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury the dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. Now, this is a man who is assigned. He did not tell him, follow me. He said, go and preach the kingdom of God. So sometimes you, can, you could be assigned and you've been sent, but you still want to be a follower. Many of us here have prayed, have prayed, have, is it prayed against or preached against the receive mentality? Where I receive, I receive. The anointing is in you already full. I receive, I receive. How together? I think, was it last week or the other week? We talked about selfishness, selflessness, and selfulness, right? To be selfish, you think about only you. To be selfless, you've forgotten yourself and you think about others. But to be selfful, you're full. And then out of your abundance, you cover the rest. And I think that is more joyful. Jesus came from his abundance he gave to us. But for us, when you're selfish, we, you're bad. When you're selfless, we say you're good. Because we are benefiting. But I'm saying, no. First fill yourself. Then out of that abundance, you can share. Praise the living God. 
A person who is giving to you out of sacrifice. There is a transaction. That pain is transferred to you. If you don't have the grace to avert it, you're going to suffer altogether. Remember Gehazi? He went and partook of clothes and this and that, gold and silver, and he received the leprosy of Haman. It's called Naman. Praise God. Those are spiritual things. 61, right? And another also said, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go and bid them farewell, which are at home at my house. And 62 says, Jesus said unto him, No man, having put his hand on the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. So, here we're talking about your resolve. Some of us have a resolve to follow Christ, but we make the wrong choices in following him. Following Christ is not necessarily following him on a straight road. It is simply fulfilling the assignment he has given you. Praise the living God. I hope I am clear. Praise God. I'm going to read a, quick, a scripture quickly here. Luke 18, 31 to 34. Then he took unto him twelve and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. Remember we said that there is a book written about you, right? And the Lord God manifests this word. Jesus manifests this word in your face. And here, the assignment he's going to take on, it has already been preordained. It has been preordained. So many of us, we have told, for example, I've told you you're going to be a man of God. You're going to be, you're an apostle, you're a prophet. Those things are already manifesting, right? Now, you can ask, but how, when, where, which? Wait for it, it's coming. Whether in the market, in the marketplace you're going to prosper. But you're going to serve God. <laughs> if I'm Uncle V. <laughs> you're going to serve God and it will be sweet it will be very nice for you wait and see all your friends are going to serve you all your friends I repeat are going to serve you I didn't mean to start prophesying but let's continue okay where are we for he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles and shall be mocked and spitefully entreated and spitted on and they shall scourge him and put him to death, and the third day he shall rise again. 34, and they understood none of these things, and this saying was hid from them, neither knew they the things which were spoken. You can be with Jesus, he's teaching you every day, and you're saying, yes, I receive fire, muriro and yet you understand nothing. Right now I'm reading these things. They are very clear, right? But maybe they are not. Maybe there's a greater revelation. What I'm saying is, with our wisdom, we understand up to a certain level. But there is more. That's why we can preach the same scripture every Sunday and it's a different revelation. And revelation is a gift from God. Amen? So today, here, the Christ is simply saying that because of his resolve in ministry, he's willing to suffer all these things from feeble men, from weak men, men he has come to save, and he's still willing to die for them. His resolve is sure, and his choices will remain sure. His choice is to remain and fulfill his purpose. But now the ones who love him so much have understood nothing. They want to bring fire to destroy the very work of Christ. Did they not say that, let's call fire and destroy them? And Jesus said, I never came to destroy, I came to save. I'm telling you that today, many that I, I counsel, that we, we have one-on-ones, they come to me telling me stories of how they are bad, they have made mistakes, they are not worthy, they don't even know if God still loves them, or why he has forgotten them and all that. And God is telling you that, as for him, in the next 50 years, he loves you the same way he loves you today. He, he will never change his mind about you. 
he will never change his mind about you. So the rest is your resolve and the right choice. In your choice, choice making, improve every day. Improve every day. There is opportunity to improve every day. One, one piece of advice, this one God didn't tell me. I've said it many times. If you think your life is so bad, or if you think you're a very bad person, become rich. Everyone will call you good. Am I lying? When you're broke, you're bad. <laughs> Believe me. I, okay, I have a friend. He's always talking about which land he has bought, these acres on an island, this way, this way. But I'm like, this guy here, is he lying? Is he not? Remember, I'm a prophet. I'm supposed to know, but I don't know. So for me, when I saw that I can no longer argue with him, I told him, ah, for me, I'm a son of a rich man. <laughs> Argument ended. Who was I talking about? I was talking about God. Out together. I was talking about my God. I'm a son of God. I'm a son of a rich man. Five years later, if truly those stories were true, five years later, we should see evidence, right? The next piece of evidence, I was the one praying for him for financial breakthrough. Have you understood? This mouth is good, but if you use it anyhow, for encouraging yourself in a lie, you will be discovered and it will be sad then. I'd rather you keep quiet while you enjoy your money with a big spoon. As you grow, the bigger you expand, the more you grow, the, the more peaceful and gentle you become. It even becomes easier to help other people. You, you no longer have competition. The best person to compete with is yourself. Set a target, achieve it. Set another, achieve it. Set another, achieve it. Achieving it may not be easy, but achieve it. When you do achieve, you will not feel like you've achieved because there's another target to set. All that is simple wisdom. Amen? But there are people who are always talking about what they want to achieve, and it remains a story. Five years from now, you're still telling stories. Do you know you start avoiding that person? Those are the people who become bitter. Because they'll see for you who is not talking, things are moving on. They're like, then they'll ask you where you go. When they say, when they say where, show us where you went, you know what that means. They're looking for which doctor. Praise the living God. So we are saying today, keep your resolve and keep your choices right. The apostles walk with Jesus, they are disciples, they are taught, they have knowledge, they have faith. But... Their choice is let's destroy these people because they refuse to receive Jesus. It has happened to some of you. You invite me to your home. I come as a minister. But you have this brother or sister who is wiring me questions which are irrelevant. And you see that the questions are embarrassing. And I tell you, ah, no, it is okay. But in all situations like that, by the time we are done, they are crying and they are born again. God has a way. He knows what to do. Yes, you'll feel bad, but it's okay. Jesus suffered worse than all of us. For, for no reason, almost. Okay, for the reason of love. His purpose was to love us and was willing to suffer to the end. But I'm saying today, grow yourself and allow low wisdom and high wisdom to prevail with you. That is sunesis, right? Have an understanding of it. And all shall be well. Praise the living God. I'm going to give an example from the Bible. David's resolve. 1 Samuel 17, 38 to 48. 1 Samuel 17. I can tell you the story, but usually I like to read. I can tell you the story. And then Anna, you inspired me. You inspired me to, to share something. There's something she said. Those who don't know Anna, she's one of the most gentle people I've met in my life. <laughs> but she has, her heart is paining. She, it, it hurts her that people are sinning. It hurts her that people are not repenting. It hurts her that people are bad. But can't people see that God is good? I, I've used my language. 
the message you shared was clear. And then wh where I got challenged is in a cell group setting. It's like, and ministers don't even talk about these things. We don't even preach these things. Now that's where it pierced me. I'm like, ah, is it Anna speaking or the Holy Spirit? So I'm going to start teaching those things, but don't these just people from church? <laughs> together if I come with a message that seems to be condemning you you'll be like ah I think there's something wrong with the uncle B nowadays let's keep a Sunday we'll come the other Sunday I think you'll have come down but she was talking about things that happen in schools in society uh, promiscuity neglect for, 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 for the kingdom of God let's put it that way and I'm like at her age I never thought like that. May I got saved after university. That's why I know that I'm called of God. Some of you have been saved all your life, but you're not yet preaching. Either you've re rejected the call, or your eyes are like of the disciples. Closed. <laughs> Praise the living God. And Saul armed David with his armor, and he put, put on an, an helmet of brass upon his head, and also armed him with a coat of mail. We all know this story that uh, David, when he, David came, he presented himself as one that would destroy Goliath or Goliath, and uh, Saul immediately gave him armor. And the armor in itself was going to destroy David, it was too heavy for him. Remember, he was a little tiny guy, a young guy, and uh, that was not for him. So he's like, No, this cannot. It will not happen with me. So the armor was put aside. Did, hope you did not skip. 39, okay. And David guarded his sword upon, upon his armor and, assay, and he assayed to go. He decided and he started to move. And he had, no, he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with this for I have not proved them. And David put them off. By proved here, he was, he was not skilled in using the things. He did not know how to use them altogether. And sometimes if you're armed with something you cannot use, it is going to be a burden to you altogether. I've seen in movies where someone who cannot shoot a gun, they give you a gun, you shoot, and the gun takes you. I watch a lot of cartoons with the kids, but sometimes I can watch a movie also. Sounds like, so Uncle B, you're so evil. <laughs> it's not evil to watch movies but if the movie starts watching you then that is evil because it's wasting your time it's called entertainment you wake up when the movie has ended you've wasted time praise God and he took his stuff in his hand and chose his five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in the, in the shepherd's bag which he had remember he was a, tra a shepherd trained of God even in the crib and his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. 41. And the Philistine came and drew near unto David, and the man that bare the shield went before him. That was Goliath coming toward him. And the Philistine looked up about and saw David. He disdained him, he undermined him, for he was a youth and broody and... Uh, of a fair countenance. I like this thing. The word rudy and fair countenance should be, not be in the same sentence. All together. But here it is. We continue. 41, 43. And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that you have, that you have come to me with? Steps. And the Philistine cast David by his gods. Now, this is where the war begins. It's now a war of gods. It's no longer spear and... Uh, sling it's now a war of god the power of the mouth we continue and the philistine said unto david come to me and i will give you i'll give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and the beasts of the field 41 40 i don't know why 41 is in my head then say david unto the philistine thou comes to me with the sword and with the spear and with the shield but i come to you in the name of the lord of hosts the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. 46. 
This day will the Lord deliver you into my hand, and I will smite thee, and take your head from thee, and I will give the carcasses to the host of the Philistines this day, and to the fowls of the air, and the beasts of the earth, and all may know that there is a God in Israel. 7. And all the assembly shall know that the Lord saves, saves not with the sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will, and he will give you into my hand. 48. And it came to pass, when the Philistines arose, and came and drew near to meet him, to meet David, that David quickened or hastened and ran toward the army to meet the Philistines. We stop there. Now, this is little David. I don't know the difference in size, but instead of running away from an army, he's running toward them. And it is bold. He has rejected all the natural armor. He has rejected to operate in a certain realm. He has, he's using Sophia. No, he's using Sunesis. He's using understanding that this battle is no longer canon. This man has involved his God, and David is also involving his God. What did David do that is extraordinary? He simply said, you come to me with spear, javelin, shield, and all that, but I come to you in the name of the Lord. And this day, the same words that other people used, he turned them around against him. And it was so. All together. So today, what are we sh sharing here? That the resolve of David did not waver. All together. It did not change. However little he was, it did not change. Remember, he had already told the king that, as for me, I've killed the bear, I've killed the lion. I've done all the training I need, and I'm going to fight in the way that I'm trained. All together. I'm going to fight in the way that I am trained. So today, that thing in your spirit, take the choice to fight the way you are trained. Otherwise, God will give you another method. Esther did not fight with, uh, with anything. She fought with prayer and fasting. Daniel did not reveal secrets because he was in a political position. He fought with prayer and fasting. He used to pray, pray thrice a day, and they conspired against him to destroy him. They wanted him to bow to the, to the statues that had been created. He still did not. Decrees were written against him. The law was written against him. He still did not change. And eventually, the king commanded the entire kingdom to worship the God of Daniel. So today, your wisdom, your understanding will keep your resolve, and it will guide your choices. I've told you, no matter how wise you become, the things we're teaching, sunesis, phronesis, all those are fancy words. But if you find a man in authority, a man who knows how to read the Bible, study the word, a man that knows how to pray, he can put you down with all your wisdom, with just one decree. All together. But I say today, you're that man. You're that person. In the name of Jesus. The words I'm speaking are not rehearsed. And I'm not encouraging you, I'm not a motivational speaker. I'm presenting to you the word of truth. And it's established in you. It's a word of faith. Praise the living God. So this is to remind you about your resolve. Another person who had great resolve was the same Joseph we've talked about. He said he will be faithful to the end. He said he will be faithful to the end. He suffered many things. But we all know that the end was very beautiful. Praise God. Uh, and this brings me back to something. Somebody, I think yes, yesterday, gave me a testimony that, that I, today, I, they didn't want to tell me, but they told me anyway, that today they have read the whole Bible. They finished. Amen. Now, in the whole of TMS, only one person has so far testified that they've finished the whole Bible. If you have finished... You never told me. All those days when I said that uh, this one has read, this one has read, I was encouraging the rest. No one has testified except one. All together. So, I'm still waiting for testimony. What am I talking about? Your resolve. Take the choice to execute this small instruction. Intercession was taught today. It was taught about the word. Write the word on your hands. That is uh, in Deuteronomy 6 and Deuteronomy 11. 
write it on your hands and write it on those little boxes, whatever they call them. The priest used to wear a box on their face and it had scripture encrypted in therein. And it was to announce God's divinity, really. But today, how many have read the whole Bible? Let me force a testimony. Okay, don't put up your hand, the one person who told me, because they told me they don't want anyone to know. I said, that is your secret and the Holy Ghost. But if the Holy Spirit decides to expose you, it's still okay. How many have read the whole Bible? It is now me and one person. How many have been with me for over five years? That one you can put up your hand. That instruction was given over five years ago. Mama had not even joined us. Meaning all these guys here who are listening to me, they have refused to listen to one instruction. Only one. If I, by the way, do you know if I said, that says the Lord, bring money, you would bring it. All together. You Christians, you very, okay, giving, giving is a gift. But giving is easier, is easier than reading the Bible. And remember, we read the scripture that says that the one who brings gold to the altar, which one sanctifies the other? Does the gold sanctify the altar or does the altar sanctify the gold? The altar sanctifies the gold. So your giving, if you try to bribe God, is not going to work. I think I saw it in Hosea 4, the last verse. If you can give me Hosea 4, if I remember correctly, we are studying the, group, the book of Hosea, a certain team. The wind has bound her up in the winds, and they shall be ashamed because of their, of their sacrifice. I'm, I'm not going to share the detail, but basically, to bind, your sacrifice becomes like a bondage to you. Your, your, your giving becomes the pain. You're, you're giving it because you're pursuing God, but God is saying, no, your, your, your sacrifice is a shame. Because it is good when you're giving thanks. It's called thanksgiving, right? Thanksgiving, it comes from your heart. It comes from a place of joy. But there is giving which comes from a place of, of pain. You remember, David, I will not offer to the Lord that is not, that does not cost me. That has been made a doctrine. No, your giving comes from your understanding, your revelation of God. All together. Giving must be inspired. Because, say, ah, me, I'll just go, I'll go and sow a seed. It will work for me. Yes, it will work. But you, you'll keep sowing a seed. You'll keep bribing God. All together. Praise the living God. I'm not saying, I'm not talking about, this is not about giving. I'm saying, please listen. None of, if you have been to school from P1 to P7, the things you study from P1 to P7 are more than the Bible. Am I lying? Amen. And yet, you have refused to read the Bible. You're not going to claim to be a minister when you've refused the word. Because reading the Bible in itself does not mean you have revelation knowledge. But it's a beginning. It's a good place to start, right? Like, I never went to any driving school. But the one who was going to driving school, after one, two, three weeks, three months, they might not drive as well as, as me, who, was, who never went to driving school. But at least they have a baseline. It's not illegal for them to drive slowly. Now together, please renew your resolve. And you will see that your choices will be guided by wisdom. Altogether. And then you'll find that most of the, you'll, be able, you'll be able to test me. The Bible says, let the prophets judge the prophets, right? Uh, let the teachers judge the teachers. Like when I'm teaching this word, you'll know that this is real, this is not. That is the safety net that I have. If I enter church, I'm able to tell, ah, okay, there's a problem. If you speak to me about God, even if you're quoting scriptures, I can read your spirit. The Bible will do that for you. Like Daniel, he was able to give you revelation. The book of Revelation is the book of Daniel. The man was in exile. He was a politician, he was not a prophet. But he had access to hidden secrets. And I'm saying, that is the offer that I'm making you. I'm not going to say Genesis chapter 3, receive. No. Please read the Bible. Amen? 
I'm hoping for another testimony. Father God, in the name of Jesus, that person that testified, show them off in the name of Jesus. Announce them in the mighty name of Jesus. If God throws you, he's the one who has chosen, not me. But uh, so that our testimony is true, that you actually finish reading the Bible. Even now you're going to start feeling, I'm already feeling something in my neck. Are you feeling it? Show me a sign. <laughs> Father God, I thank you. <laughs> Father God, I magnify your name. Praise God. Praise the living God. Now, the, the basic teaching is conviction, re, re, your resolve and choice. It's more, more or less conviction. Remain in God. It doesn't have to be too exciting. Remain in God. It does not have to be too exciting. Amen? And yet serving God while you're excited is also nice. I gave you the example that when the choir, for example, is singing and you're singing along, who is actually worshipping? You can find these guys are just singing because they're used to singing. But for you, when they sing that song, you feel that presence, right? You feel that. So we have to pray for these guys. They could have just crammed the song and their heart is not there. That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> you know, it's hard to fight someone who is behind you. <laughs> Praise the living God. But we understand each other, right? And uh, every time, like I'm a minister of God, you can remove the, the Bible from me, but I'll be able to teach the word of God. And I ask myself, is that from my heart or is it from my knowledge? Knowledge of the head. So I have to keep telling God, reveal to me your word so that it's no longer i can teach a message i taught 10 years ago and it would be nice but i'm now teaching because i know is my heart in it maybe not so we are all not safe you have to keep praying for me as i pray for you then there are those who say that ah, but now uncle b what can i pray for you for you, you you've reached reached where work out your salvation with fear and trembling to get saved today we are saved every day until we meet the master. You, you don't get saved today and it's done. We are saved every day, every day until we meet the master. So, okay, I'm gifted, it's obvious. You're gifted. Do you think I can present myself to God that God, now me, you know, I'm Uncle B, I'm a prophet, I'm a pastor, I'm this, and try to let God, let God know that now because I'm me, let the gates be opened. No, I also have to grow in this thing. I'm equipped to equip, but the more I receive, the more I'll be judged. Teachers shall be judged harshly, the Bible says. If I teach you the wrong things, I'm finished. I, I feel, by the just teaching the word is a risk. I'm not saying that God is on standby that Bob, I'm waiting for you. The day I get you, no. But it is a risk. Okay, let's look at it like this, like a parent. A parent can offend their child without knowing they've offended them. Now together, imagine you have a party. Then me, I've invited my friends. The parents says my friends are not good. Then they embarrass my friends. In effect, they have embarrassed me, right? Then I can keep that seed in my heart and start hating my parent, that they are bad. And yet the parent was trying to help me. Now together. That one happened to me, but I might not tell you the story. When Elevel, we had a friend, he stole 100 kilos of cement. In other words, he stole two bags of cement. He, his father was building. What did he do with the, the cement? He sold them and brought money for what? For drinking. Did I drink their, their, their alcohol? No, I didn't. But turns out, we were invited to a party. Like, come with your friends. The father pulled us aside. That's the reason he invited us. That I'll attribute the failure of my son to you. I've never gone back to that home. <laughs> I did nothing. I was not part of the transaction. But the parent was communicating a good thing. But I think he directed it to the wrong people. He did not know that or were not part of it. I was one of the so-called, the, the, the little good friends. But when he said that, I understood his pain. I was not born again, but I think I, God was still with me. 
So we spoke to this guy, and he had to go and apologize to his father. Because, actually, up to today, we have never met him. Because we're like, ah. And the father was, those days, the first people to have guns were like, man. <laughs> Praise the living God. Okay. Faith never fails. This is now to encourage you in your resolve. Faith never fails. Even weak faith does not fail. If you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can tell this mountain to be removed and it shall be removed, right? So, however small, even if you feel you're shivering, you cannot even pray. Some of you cannot pray for one minute because you're remembering the pain of your heart, right? You're remembering this and that. But God is saying, faith never fails. That's 1 Corinthians 13, 13. We all know that chapter of love. I always tell people, every place you find, love does not do this, love does not do that, love does not do that, love does not do that. Put your name. Do it right. My, the verse I want is 13, 13. 1 Corinthians 13, 13. Faith never fails. So the sacrifice of your love now, it will never die. It may seem like it's not doing anything, but it will never die. Now abide the faith. Abide, it lives forever, right? Faith lives forever. Hope lives forever. Love lives forever. The word charity is love. These three, the greatest of them is love. Now, what I'm telling you is not part of what I'm teaching, but show, show me where, I love the, where it begins love. Love this, love that, love that, love that. Just a little up. Pick from anywhere, maybe verse 6 or something. Okay, though I, although I bestow all my goods and feed the poor. Okay, love. Now, remove the word love, put your name. Bob suffers long and is kind. Bob envies not. Bob vaunts not. Bob is not puffed up. Bob, put your name you'll realize that uh, perfection is near you. Put your name out together. Praise the living God. You're not easily provoked. You're not easily this. You're not this. You're not that. You're peaceable. We say the highest form of wisdom is peace. The highest form of wisdom is peace. And you'll find you have peace with everyone. The reason we don't have peace is because we want to answer. We want to be heard. I've told you, do not try to be understood, but try to understand. You will find that life will be easier. There is when you have to tell them, you feel that, like, me, I'm going to tell them. No, calm down. You'll find that if you seek to understand others, they will easier understand you. They will start calling you humble, gentle. That one listens. That one is this. And yet you know that you're the one who has manufactured this thing. Remember Esther? The king kept asking, what shall I do for you? What shall I do for you? I'll give you up to half the kingdom. I'll give you, I'll give you. Because she kept saying, no, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, I'll tell you. But for you, if they give you one chance, you'll bring out the whole Bible. For me, for this, for that, even the other time, the other day, this, that, that, that. And God is saying, Calm down. It shall be well. Love never fails. Faith never fails. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. Meaning hope will not fail as well, but it can be carried forward. So if you keep carrying forward your blessing, you're going to suffer. But the day will come. And when hope is finally fulfilled, you will forget the pain. Who has ever been very broke that they didn't even have transport? When you finally got money, did you remember the poverty? Exactly. Very simple. Praise the living God. Hebrews 10, 39. Oh, time has actually gone. I think I've also reached. For yet a little while, and he shall come. He, he that shall come will come and will not delay. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them that draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe 
to the saving of the soul. That is very clear, right? Do not draw back. He that comes to God must believe that he is, and he is a reward of them that diligently seek him. Hebrews 11.6. We are saying, your resolve must be sustained by you. Take the right choices. Take the choice. You have a resolve, but take the choice to remain in that resolve. And there you'll have access to more. You'll have access to more things. Praise God. And then we say, I'm tell, what I'm sharing is your faith and this resolve, they work together. And we're saying faith never fails. First John 5, 4 says, but whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. So your faith and your resolve, they're synonymous. They move together. They move together. And then 2 Corinthians 4.18, I'm reading. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Now, remember I told you, your sunesis is an understanding of natural things, low and high, spiritual things, supernatural things, low and high. And it goes beyond that cycle or circle. All together. So, you get to know things which are unseen, that are untold, that are unknown. Is that clear? So here, as we're talking wisdom, you cannot run away from faith because faith is the only contact you have with God. Somebody's hand is warm, warm or hot. I seem to know you. Is it Laura? Is there like, it's like, I don't know. It's like, have you ever had fire being waved around you? Now, be like, Uncle B, where did they do that to you from? Witchcraft. <laughs> I'm just, I'm feeling heat moving around my hand. And it is somebody. It is somebody. I don't know who you are. If you're there, put up your hand. There's a purpose. I may not have the answer now, but God will give it to me. But I perceive it is Laura. I don't know. Are you feeling hot in one hand? Okay, let's continue. Praise the living God. Now, we Christians, we are challenged by this thing. Belief is not faith. We all believe, right? We have shared the scripture where we know that the devil also believes and trembles. So just because you believe doesn't mean it is faith. Faith has resolved to it. Faith is deliberate. Faith does not deny fact, but it recognizes truth. The truth of the gospel. That's why I say read the Bible. The facts may look like this. Someone is sick. That's the fact. But faith says no. They are healed. So when you pray over them, you're not praying because you're anticipating healing. You're praying because it's a finished work. So that is one challenge we Christians have. And those are the choices you must take. Whether to remain in that place of believing that ha, let's pray and fast for three days or in the name of Jesus be healed. That is the grace you have. And then, this one may sound contradictory, but faith is not necessarily for Christians. Does that make sense? When does Christianity start? At the cross, right? After the cross, the resurrection, right? That is when you can claim to be a Christian. Even the disciples were not Christians. But uh, there maybe you'll say, but they were with Jesus. Okay, fine. When Abraham, Abraham is called the father of faith, right? So was Abraham a Christian? No. When Elijah and the widow of Zarephath, when uh, he told her, bring me food and I eat first, then you'll also give yourself later. He used faith, right? Was he a Christian? No. Now today, faith is a law, but it's also a principle. If you execute faith in God, it will give you its results. Faith is a law, like gravity. It, is, it doesn't discriminate whether you're born again or not. But when you're born again, it, makes, it is easier. You have access to different dimensions. Is that, is that clear? You have access to greater dimensions. But today, this thing challenged me for a long time. But finally, I have an idea. You find a Muslim who is very rich. Because he is a giver. 
Then you'll find a bone again, very powerful in the word, and it's broke. Very simple, right? These miracles that we do as born again, I've gotten to here. I don't know how true it is that even uh, is it the sheik, the sheikhs or something? They also do them. Is that true? Only that they say there's a connotation of witchcraft. I don't know, but I know that many actually there are people in here, maybe not now. Tell Papa. I'm lucky I found you. I was this close to going to a seca. Is it seca? And me, I'm like, what does the seca do? He has a basin and water. He stirs it up and he sees you. Then he starts telling you. I'm like, hey, okay. So I'm now separating the kind of miracles we're talking about. Even the devil can perform a miracle. Lying wonders, the Bible calls them. But uh, let your resolve remain in God. Remain in God. Don't, don't be tempted by a shortcut. The shortcut will ultimately destroy you. Amen? Praise God. Unbelief. Well, now, this is going to explain why I say belief is different from, from faith. This is Matthew 17, 20. This is Jesus talking to his people. The Bible says, Matthew 17, 20, and Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, If you have faith as a grain of a mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, Be re removed hence and be placed, and it shall be removed, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Now, how is it possible that men that are working with Jesus have unbelief? Altogether, they have a lack of faith. So you can be born again and you don't have faith. Yes, salvation comes by through faith, through grace, through by, through by grace, through faith. Everyone has a dose of faith, but there are levels of faith that you must develop. And some of us, when it comes to certain things, we have unbelief. That is where we struggle. Like, ah, for me, I'm just an usher. That one, you've all heard it before, right? For me, I like to be, me, I'm small unbelief so you can have christ and actually be counted as one that has no belief you can one read romans 10 9 9 10 where it says with your heart you believe and with your mouth confession made unto salvation but ephesians ephesians 2 4 5 6 will show you that faith grace they move together so you can have a dose of it but your resolve and choices will determine how far you go. Praise the living God. Praise the living God. Now, in Luke 17, 5, the apostles told Jesus, increase our faith. That is to justify to us that faith can increase. And that will only increase by your resolve. Amen? Praise the living God. I'm done with the message of today. I'm done with the message of today. Praise the living God. But however, for Anna, <laughs> I, don't know when, I don't know how I'll do this. One of my brothers had a, a birthday party over the weekend. And he's my brother invited me. Even if he didn't invite me and I want to go out, go. But now the party is a real party of the world. You, they call it dutton in tables and stuff like that. There's a lot of beer, a lot of these big bottles and stuff and this and that. Now, this is my brother. I have to choose whether to, to celebrate love with him or just be like, ah, this is evil. All together. But this person, you love them. And the Bible says perfect love has no fear, right? It casts away all fear. Now, fine, there's music playing. Remember, before I got born again, I loved music so much, so much that that music is still here. All together. But the good thing, there's a file for gospel also now. But the other file is there, it's dormant. But now the thing is starting to hit and you, you, you're saying, okay, okay, it is working, it is working. Have you understood me? Now I'm seated. 
They give me Coca-Cola, as usual. They used to call me Mirinda because I used to drink soda. But then someone told me, stop drinking soda. But just that day, I took a Coca-Cola. Now, in that congregation was a person who had been to TMS for maybe five years ago, something in Nambole. A lady. Okay, young girl. She has dressed like Miss World, if you understand me. She was smart. She was smart. But she was smart for that, in that environment. She, couldn't, she can't come here dressed the way she was dressed. All together. Now me, I, I could not recognize her. But now me, my chief face, that, that guy, she asked somebody, isn't that guy a pastor? He told her, yes. Is he drinking? I think she's trying to get support. Because she was drinking. And uh, they said, no, he's not. Then she's like, okay. Now, this person comes and tells me that, hey, you've been sniped here, so be very careful. I was like, no, I'm not going to be careful. I'm not doing anything evil. But when I was leaving home, uh, mama, we, me and mama had a joke that, ha, now you go and what? You're now going out there to witness evil. What is evil? The party that the guys are having. Now, later on, now the moment she realized that I'm not drinking, immediately she's convicted. She possibly gets uncomfortable. Like, ha, Papa has found me where? Waweru. We call it Waweru. I found her. But uh, for me, I, I, I seem, when I met her, it's for praise God, praise God. And she was, I think, with her boyfriend or friend, who is a boy. Who I also know because we grew up in the same neighborhood. And everyone is like, ah, man of God, praise God. I, have, I greet her, I salute her as a Christian and we speak. And then the boyfriend is, for him he knows me as, I mean, these were neighbors. It's like, ah, Bobby, what up? And I'm like, ah, what's up? Then when everyone is calling me man of God, he says, assalamu alaikum. <laughs> it was quite interesting. But uh, why am I sharing this? I can give you scriptures. I'm talking to Anna here. Like in that situation, the love of my brother supersedes the bottles on the table. Right? But uh, another, another Christian can say, I will not attend that function. All together. That same brother of mine, his children, um, they are Godfather, the Catholic style. I had the choice to be like, but me, I'm, let's be serious. You even know I'm a pastor, but you're involving me in these things. But the love within my heart for him supersedes all these other things. And indeed, I know I'm not affected, but I have to be careful how I present myself, for example, for the sake of, you know, you're born again, you're born again on Sunday and other days, Saturday or not. Friday, Saturday is a very dangerous period. Sunday, we are the same. But together. So that is one way. I did not condemn. Neither was I condemned. But they are waiting for me to just move one bottle, I think, or one glass. And they say, aha, uh -huh, these are the pastors we have. All together. That is one way to look at it. Another is if you don't have the faith or the strength, the Bible says, while you're rescuing, you who is spiritual, rescuing a man that has fallen, uh, the Bible tells you, be careful. Because as you're rescuing them, you might fall. If you have a history of liking a certain thing, and you're supposed to rescue someone from that thing, please don't risk. You will fall. Because, not because you're not spiritual, but because you also carry the flesh. Amen? The Bible says it's not for kings to drink alcohol. I have scriptures here, but I don't think I'll give, I'll, I'll send you a WhatsApp. <laughs> Usually when you're given to say alcohol, the contrary spirit, it is going to lead you further than that. They say sin takes you more than you want to go. And the challenge with sin, now this is the effect of sin, but we generally understand it as sin. The challenge with sin, this kind of, the drinking and all that, as you enjoy yourself, you make merry. The Bible says, drink a little. I mean, it, go and read Ecclesiastes. It give, makes you merry. It makes you happy. And it's God's will for you to be happy. Altogether. But 
not on the spirit that binds us.